Well, once again, our grateful thanks to James for putting those uh, prayers together for us. So thank you, brother, for doing that. Well, we're going to turn to God's word now. So before we do that, let's just pray and then we can read the passage together. Dear Lord, as we study your word to, again tonight, may the words come afresh to us. And may the enlightenment that you've given to me during this past week bring us closer in our walk with you. Amen. Well, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, 2 Corinthians. And we're looking at chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 in particular. And let me read these verses to you. Chapters, uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Paul says this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. Such confidence we have throughout, through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God, who has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Well, I said at the introduction of our service tonight, I'm sure that uh, many of us are desperate to get back into the church and to meet together to worship. And, you know, I believe God's been showing us his purpose through this pandemic, because in light of what we thought about last Sunday morning from Acts 6, how God wasn't going to allow anything to get in the way of the main thing, that was the spread of the gospel. I think we should actually be rejoicing today because there's clearly been an uptake in people listening online to God's word being preached. However, although it's encouraging that many who would probably never think of entering a church on a Sunday are being exposed to God's word, with so much being put out online, you know, discerning what is of the Lord and what isn't is something that I think we need to be really praying and asking God to protect folk from. Well, by no means is this something that's just a problem today. If we go back into the early church and especially to the church in Corinth, Paul's had to write to the believers because false teaching was threatening the integrity of the gospel. It was undermining the truth that Paul had very carefully brought to the Corinthians. Not only were these false teachers undermining the gospel, they were also questioning Paul's credentials as an apostle. Because it seems that these false teachers had turned up in Corinth with letters of recommendation, letters from the church in Jerusalem, something which what they were teaching, what they were advocating seems a little dubious. It's highly unlikely that these were legitimate letters. So Paul's needed to address the Corinthians in order to bring them back under the gospel of grace, the new covenant that God's made with us through Christ's blood shed for us on the cross. Well, look again at 2 Corinthians 3 and that verse 1, that first verse. Paul say, are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Well, Paul's about to spell out the credentials that he has, if he actually needed any. You know, what we never actually see Paul doing in the scriptures is blowing his own trumpet. He just gets on with the job in hand, namely preaching the gospel. Because the gospel that Paul tells us in Romans 1 is the power of God that brings salvation to all men. What Paul preached was Christ's death and resurrection so that men would come with repentant hearts and respond to God's grace and mercy. His grace and mercy that is poured out on believers such as you and I and believers everywhere. But you know, it seems from Paul's answers to some of the criticism that he'd received from these teachers was that he wasn't particularly eloquent when he spoke. He was perhaps someone who was a little bit blunt, who came straight to the point. There was even a suggestion from these false teachers as he wasn't particularly educated. 
Well, story goes in the days of John Wesley that lay preachers were usually men with limited education. And these were the men who would conduct services on Sundays. Well, one such man spoke from Luke 19, verse 21. And uh, what he said, of course, was from the King James Version. And it said this, Lord, I fear thee, for thou art an austere man. Lord, I fear thee, for thou art an austere man. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, not knowing the word austere or what it meant and living in a fishing community, this man thought that the text was speaking of an oyster man. So he went on in his sermon to explain how a diver would grope around in freezing water in the darkness, often scraping his knuckles and his hands on the sharp edges of the shells, before coming up to the surface triumphantly holding an oyster in his torn and bleeding hands. Well, we can probably see how the preacher brought that round to Christ, how Christ descended from heaven into this dark, sinful world in order to retrieve us, to bring us back into the glory of heaven. His torn, bleeding hands, a sign of the value that Christ places on us. Well, after what this man preached, 12 men came to faith. They came to Christ. They put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But later that night, Someone who'd heard this man preach complained to Wesley about this unschooled preacher's understanding of the English language. Well, of course, we know that Wesley was highly educated and his reply to this man was this. He said, never mind, the Lord got a dozen oysters tonight. Well, I don't think there's any suggesting that Paul was an ignorant man. We know that before he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, he was a highly educated scholar under a very well res respected rabbi, the man called Gamil, who we met a couple of weeks ago. And Saul was zealous for the law of Moses. In fact, this is what he said to the Philippian believers. He said this, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But something set Paul apart from these false teachers. And it was this. He'd actually met with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And like us as believers, he'd responded in full repentance and surrender to Christ's Lordship, to his authority, to his sovereignty. Paul's sinful past just like ours, had been washed clean through Christ's blood shed on the cross. And as we read in Acts 9, he'd been commissioned by the Lord to proclaim Christ's name to the Gentiles. Paul's apostolic calling was his credentials. He didn't need letters of recommendation if any were required. Then he says that the Corinthians themselves were those letters. Look at verses 2 and 3. You yourselves are our letters written on our, your, on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. So secondly, this morning, we're thinking about letters written on the heart. Well, I guess it begs the question today as to whose heart our lives are written on today. Is it still very much on ours or written on the Lord Jesus Christ's heart? See, without just waving a huge banner over our heads, proclaiming that we're Christians, which of course we should never do, I wonder, is it obvious to those that we meet that we not only have a knowledge of who Jesus is, but that we know him personally and we've responded to his love and mercy by submitting our lives to him? and now carrying out his will in this world. The Puritan preacher and theologian Stephen Charnock gives us a warning when he says this. He said a man may be theologically knowing, but at the same time spiritually ignorant. Well, what Paul's saying to the believers in Corinth was that the transformation in their hearts and in their lives was evident to all. We see that there in verse 3. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. 
That's Paul's accreditation to the church, should they have ever asked him for one. These were real people that Paul's talking about here, the, the church in Corinth. These were real people who responded to the gospel of salvation that Paul preached faithfully. And all who'd witnessed firsthand Paul's integrity as a believer, his all-surpassing love for Jesus, something that in turn, of course, he passed on to his hearers, along with his desire, as he tells us in Philippians 3, to know Christ more. Well, that same accreditation should be what marks us out as a people belonging to God. Something Paul said of the Corinthian believers in verse 3, you show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. Well, of course, today when we think about writing letters, we tend to use computers, don't we? Whereas in the past, we would have written a letter or a document on paper. We'd have used a pen, probably a fountain pen, but with ink. But just look again at towards the end of verse 3 at what Paul describes Jesus using when writing in our hearts. He says this, Jesus writes not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Well, you know, in time, ink on paper or on parchment, as it would have been in Paul's day, it fades. Whereas, of course, when Jesus writes his law into our hearts, it's indelible. It's going to remain for eternity. The great uh, Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon suggests that the pen in God's hands were the apostles. The ink, the sacred fluid of the Holy Spirit, the mysterious influence that flows through our very lives as Christians. And of course the paper, our hearts. Well, scripture reveals that God won't write on hard, stubborn hearts of stone. But in the softness of hearts that have yielded completely to him. As Spurgeon went on to say, a soft heart absorbs the ink. A living tablet best retains impressions. So Lord, write in us and then make us the pen of the ready writer to make our mark on others. You know, I'm sure the false teachers who'd come claiming to have letters of recommendation couldn't claim the same confidence that Paul had, that what they were teaching was leading people to Christ. It wasn't. It was confusing them. Well, chapter 2, verse 17, Paul says this, And like so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, as those sent by God. Well, look, we've been now down at verses 4 to 6. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. As we know, Moses received God's covenant, the law that he received on Sinai, the law that was written on both sides of stone tablets. But what the law couldn't do Paul tells us Christ did in his body on the cross. This is what he said in Romans 8 verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous, the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What Paul's advocating here in verse 6 is that, along with the other apostles, he'd been set apart by God to be a minister of the new covenant. And that's my third point this morning. Ministers of the new covenant. You go back into the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, God says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, 
This is my covenant I will make with the people of Israel. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Well, that new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of is fulfilled in Jesus. And God had called Paul from his persecution of the church that we see in Acts to go and preach the new covenant in Christ's blood to the Gentiles. It's only God who gave to Paul and to others the competence to preach the word. Verse 5, we see not of the letter, in other words, the law written on stone that Paul says kills, but of the spirit of Christ that gives life to all who turn to him with repentant hearts. Well, I'm sure if we'd had a conversation with Paul or Saul as he was prior to meeting with the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road, he would have argued vehemently with you that he was saved, saved through keeping the law. But sadly, like everyone else, Paul failed to keep the law. And of course, he stood guilty of disobeying God, which meant he stood condemned to a spiritual death before God. Well, later, Paul wrote to the believers in Galatians saying this, For all who rely on the works of the Lord, the law rather, are under a curse. As it's written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. But then Paul also goes on to say, But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is the gospel message that the world so desperately needs to hear from those God's called, those that he set apart to preach his word. The, their credentials being that Jesus has written their names on his heart, not with ink, but with his spirit, setting them apart like Paul to be ministers of the new covenant. You know, we desperately need to continue to pray that God will go on raising up faithful men to proclaim the gospel. And that he'll silence the false teachers of today so that through the ministry of the word proclaimed with integrity through faithful men many will come to know christ and receive his law written not on paper nor on stone but in the very tablets of our hearts amen loving father thank you for these words today and we thank you lord god that you do indeed write our names upon your heart and they're written lord not on tablets of stone but on tablets of the heart and lord we thank you that what's written is there for eternity lord in your loving name tonight we thank you for jesus amen well we're going to uh, close our service tonight by singing another wonderful hymn and we could think of nothing other that, that was suitable for tonight than to sing in Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Let's sing these words together, shall we? <laughs> 